name is Roy Karp. I am zooming in from Boston, Massachusetts in New England, Northeast uh, part of the United States. I'm really excited for this. I was reading the bios of the other members, uh, the other panelists, um, very humbling. You're just amazing, some amazing folks on the, uh, in this panel. Um, the conversation today is inspired by the butterfly, um, which are not only elegant and beautiful creatures, but also serve as a living metaphor for the role that each of us plays in our shared ecosystem. Like the butterfly, we can each be pollinators. The work we do individually each day may seem like small contributions, but collectively these small actions help produce the healthy food that sustains us and nourishes our communities. These talks are organized to connect, share, inspire, and spread these butterflies effects wider for the sake of revitalizing our human and non-human ecosystems. Uh, we have Cynthia Tina, um, known as the community matchmaker. I love that. Um, I need, I, I want to I want to be, I want to become a community matchmaker. Um, she helps uh, people join hundreds of intentional communities she's visited um, and worked with around the globe. She's a speaker, educator, and co-director of the Foundation for Intentional Community. Lauren Breland is a force. She is a fierce advocate for human rights, an educator, facilitator, engaging motivational speaker, a poet, former US Peace Corps volunteer, and believer in the ability of all humans to transform their lives for the better. Um, Daiken Patel is co-founder of Jail University and member of Move by Love Social Project at the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmed Ahmedabad. Sorry, if I apologize if I butchered that. Um, Penina Lesorogal Les is an activist and empowers women in her village through her beautiful beadwork. And if you look at her bio, there's a, there's a YouTube video and there's links to websites for all these folks in the, in the bio section on the website. Um, well, hi everyone, I'm Cynthia. It's really great to be here. And I have so much appreciation for Dan and the Reimagine Education team for inviting me to present about intentional communities and how learning and education happens in intentional communities. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And let's see, there we go. Hope you can see that. Good. All right, so here's the presentation about education and intentional communities, what learning can look like in co-housing eco-villages and more. And this is a photo here of Cloth Jordan Eco Village. It's one of the many communities I visited around the world. They um, are a multi-generational community, so do have a bit of an educational component happening. Although like most intentional communities, the kids who live in this community go to school outside of the community. So just to, to preface that, I'm gonna be sharing models of education in community, but usually the formal education of kids happens outside of the community in just public school systems um, or private school systems as they normally would. A little bit about me to get started. Um, as uh, Roy mentioned, I am a community matchmaker. I've been fortunate to have traveled the world visiting all kinds of different intentional communities. I didn't grow up in one. Uh, often people think, oh, you must have been raised in a community. Um, no, I was, I was raised outside of Boston in the Northeast of Massachusetts. Yeah, Roy, we have that connection. Um, and did not grow up in an intentional community, just a normal mainstream family. But I, I had this innate curiosity about different ways of living and more uh, ways of connecting more deeply with nature and other people. And this exploration really led me to go on and travel to visit a bunch of these places. And I think for me, that in of itself was an incredible educational experience. I actually got my degree from Goddard College, which is a low residency school promoting um, independent self-discovery. You have no classes. Uh, you get evaluated by your professors based on um, different written materials you su supply and um, educational experiences that you seek out. 
so I have a degree in sustainability and got that degree through visiting these different communities and then, um, and then also attending Goddard College. These are some of the groups I've been fortunate enough to work with, the Global Ecovillage Network, which is also a really good resource for, for learning about intentional communities. Ecovillage.org is that website. Ecolees, which is a European initiative bringing together all different kinds of movements related to community, such as Ecovillage, Transition Town, co-housing initiatives. The Youth Ecovillage Network, it's kind of where I got my legs. Uh, Next Gen, supporting young people connecting with intentional communities. And Numundo, which is a network of impact centers. Uh, their website is numundo.org. It's set up to be an alternative Airbnb. So you can actually book a stay at one of these centers uh, as you would through Airbnb. So a great resource for travelers. But where I mostly work today is with the Foundation for Intentional Community at ic.org. We're a 35 year old nonprofit organization that uh, supports and promotes intentional communities, helping people learn how to join and start one and learn from these incredible experimentation centers. And this is my home. So this is where I am normally. I'm actually on vacation right now in, in Colorado, um, but I'm normally in Vermont where I live at Headwaters Eco Village. It's a small community, about a dozen residents and six kids were, were surrounded by this, this larger village next to Cabot in Vermont, which has many families. Many of the families homeschool, which is also, I would say, more common in intentional communities, this kind of homeschooling model. Uh, you can see the garden here in this photo. This is the main focus of our community, kind of the thing that brings us all together. This is what it looks like right now in the winter with our very, snowy winters. Another unique thing about our community is everyone who has lived here has built their own home. So this is my neighbor's house. This is my house under construction. I'm about two years into the process. Um, this is a more recent photo. It's coming along. We have a wood stove. It's staying warm through the winter, working on the inside. Um, and creating your house and community is such an incredible learning experience and itself a community building experience. Um, so actually, this is a photo, if you guys know, one of the conference organizers, Dan, he lives at a community, another community in Vermont, and they came over one day and helped me with building my house. So it's a really cool inter-community collaboration that has happened. Um, this is a wall that's built out of slip and ship. So mixing clay and wood chips, it's a natural building technique. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about what is an intentional community. So when I use that term, I'm referring to a group of people who live together or who share common facilities and who regularly associate with each other on the basis of explicit common values. So that's the definition from our organization, the Foundation for Intentional Community. And what we're really getting at here is that an intentional community is created when the group of people come together on the basis of this really core set of values, vision, mission, and then future members buy into that same value set. And what I'm talking about here is also place-based or residential communities. Of course, you can have online intentional communities. But we're talking about communities that inhabit specific places. Many benefits to living in an intentional community. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I, I do wanna highlight like loneliness is such a big thing. Even before the pandemic, we had an epidemic of loneliness. Um, people living uh, either alone or with nuclear families. And that's not fully how we're designed to live as humans. We're designed to live in so small, close-knit social circles. And that's where we have all these health benefits and mutual connection. We're able to share resources, um, so many wonderful benefits. These are the common types of intentional communities. Again, I don't have time to go through them all, but just to give you a sense for what is out there. Um, we think of intentional community as an umbrella term that includes co-housing, eco-village, housing cooperatives, senior co-housing communities, um, and more. 
I'll mention again, IC.org. That's a great resource if you want to learn more about intentional communities and the different uh, models that exist. You can see a map of all of them. We also have the map in book form if you like to flip through and, and check out the different projects. Okay, now I'm going to get into talking about education and community. I'm so excited to speak to this um, because I think there are some really fascinating things that intentional communities are doing in regards to education. So to highlight a few, I'll start with La Cité Ecologique. This is um, a community, it means the ecological city in French. Uh, they actually have two chapters now, and one in Quebec and one in New Hampshire, both with about 80 residents. And this community began as a summer camp for kids. So the kids were going to the summer camp. They loved it so much. They convinced their parents to buy land and create a community. And today, this is a thriving community, uh, fully financially self-sufficient with multiple small businesses that actually are providing jobs to the surrounding region. And the whole focus is still on the children. So this community has a school. Um, it's actually a public school. So there's kids from the eco-village and also from the surrounding region who attend the school. And I think this is great because it's, it's breaking that idea that like, oh, intentional communities are at least bubbles off in the woods somewhere, hippie communes. Like, no, and oftentimes these communities are fully integrated into the regions in which they inhabit. Schloss Tempelhof in Germany. Uh, this is a community with over 100 residents and they have this beautiful um, um, expression. Uh, you maybe have heard, you know, the saying, oh, it takes a village to raise a child. So they say, we make the whole village accessible for our kids to learn from. So they're really uh, part of this uh, free school movement where the kids who live in this community get access to all of the residents of the community to learn from. So if somebody's a baker, they go hang out with the baker if they want to and learn from them. Um, someone does a uh, mechanical work, they're learning from that and really engaging as a full member in their community. Greenbrier School in Texas in the US. Uh, this is a school that I actually visited recently, um, this November. They began in the 60s, so very much part of the free school movement that was developing at that time. And they are both an intentional community and a school, but really a school first and foremost. So most of the residents who live in the community also work to support the school. Uh, it's this really like very, um, how to say, wild place with uh, many forests and gardens. The kids just run and play. And there's some structure, of course, if, especially if the kids really want that. But a lot of the time, they're just coming up with their own experiments and playing with each other. Groundsville Co-Housing, also called Yarrow Eco Village in British Columbia, Canada. Um, I visited this one a few years ago and I was inspired by what the founder shared with me about their school that they have for, I don't know, a lot of kids. I think they have around 30 or 40 kids who live here, is that they are committed to being outdoors all year round. Um, having kids be outside and learning, they have this um, like structure outside that's very open air. They're, they're out there, uh, rain, snow, whatever conditions, um, just really engaging with the natural world as part of their learning process. Um, also Retribe community, that's close to where I am in Vermont. And this is a model of a community that again is really focused on the school first and foremost. And their particular focus is providing educational programs for multiple different ages. That's more focused on um, personal development and connection with nature um, and also right, rites of passage work. Um, so they do a lot of work connecting with the Abenaki, which is the local tribes in Vermont and infusing that into their educational teaching with the kids. Another community I wanna highlight, um, this is an eco-village that's forming in Alabama um, by the Masok people who are actually returning to their ancestral homelands. And they're creating whole sections of their community where only their traditional language can be spoken. And so they're doing incredible work to bring um, the, the learning and the teaching and the culture of their people 
um, for this younger generation who otherwise may not have been able to access that as fully. Uh, and then Camp Hill Communities, this is my last example I want to share with you. This is a network of over 100 different intentional communities in the United States and Europe, and it's for people with mental and physical disabilities. And so it's really creating a blended community of people with and without disabilities. But the cool thing is that everyone in the community has to go to school or have a job in the community, like have a role um, that enables them to be fully integrated in, in, our, in our life. You know, I think these are some of the most marginalized members of our society. And I think it's incredible that they are getting to learn candle making and woodworking and like having these experiences that there's no way they would have access to normally. All right, so that was my little little tour of different community projects that are out there. There's a lot more. Um, I wanna share with you this guidebook that I have written with FIC. Um, you can access it directly at ic.org slash starter guide. It's a great way to learn more about the different projects that are out there and additional resources. We have um, online events that we're hosting each, each week, uh, we have one or two or sometimes three events. You can learn about them at ic.org slash events. We also have online courses. Um, so if you're really thinking of starting or joining an intentional community, that's an amazing resource, ic.org slash courses. We just launched a few days ago our new course on starting an intentional community. You can find out more at ic.org slash starting dash course. And uh, lastly, if you are serious about looking for an intentional community to join, um, as Roy mentioned, I am a community matchmaker. So I can help connect you with an intentional community that might be a good fit for you based on what you're looking for and um, yeah, who you are and what you're hoping to get out of this kind of lifestyle. And that's my website, cynthiatina.com. All right, I hope I did that in 10 minutes. I think I did. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was amazing. Um, I love uh, all the photographs. They really, they really help tell the story of each of those communities. Um, that, was, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much. I wanna live in pretty much every one of those <laughs> communities. Uh, that, that was really amazing. Um, all right, we're gonna hold questions till the end. So we're gonna move to um, Lauren Breland. Um, Lauren. Much love and blessings, everyone. How are you today? I'm uh, as equally thrilled as everyone else uh, participating in this particular conference. I just so appreciate the concept and the aspect of always learning. And I learned a lot from you, Cynthia, and I look forward to learning a lot from the rest of the contributors on this panel. Uh, my name is Lauren Breland, nickname proper. I have close to 30 years in the human services industry. I've worked from licking envelopes to sitting on the board of directors and everything in between. Uh, I have focused some of my studies uh, and, and my uh, focus has been on education in the field of education, as well as working with youth uh, in the foster care system, aging out, uh, adult education, uh, civil rights. And I am currently working back into uh, a new project uh, with formerly incarcerated, uh, assisting with their re-entry back into society. Uh, I don't have pictures for this because this particular, and I thought about that. So I was like, look at her pictures. You know what I mean? But I will provide some level of, of, of transcript <laughs> based on the fact it's kind of like a sensitive subject. So I hope that my voice and my words and my premise carry you. Uh, I want to talk to you all about uh, carefully com um, canvassing communities for effective exchange when building programs. Uh, COVID has definitely changed the way we see and look at things at this point in time. And even some of your more established programs have changed considerably without you knowing um, because the audience in which you now um, service has modified greatly. Uh, I want to 
focus. And when I say canvassing, I'm going to read from my notes so I can be specific and stay on point in time. Um, uh, canvassing is used almost in every phase of my profession. Um, most familiarly with most folks in regards to politics as a technique in order to solicit a vote or sway position, but also used to sell subscriptions, uh, insurance, cookies, I was Girl Scout, uh, and introduce and explore new situations and concerns. Uh, I used uh, specific canvassing in US, uh, working for the US Census in regards to gather, gathering data. I used it in the uh, United States Peace Corps in regards to introducing myself to my community and informing uh, them of my purpose and building a, 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 con a consensus around a particular project. And then even with the school system, when I would build programs, I would have to survey the parents and canvas the entire school system before I could really look at building an effective program. Well, this particular project that I am currently engaged in is the form of a boarding home uh, for uh, individuals exiting the um, judicial system, prison system. And um, its purpose is to develop a safe space and lodging, uh, provide wraparound services and long-term living. And um, how I came about this, uh, was that I have a very dear friend who owns a lot of properties and his, his choice of, of residence for his properties is a rather vulnerable population. And so he gets referrals from the parole and probation system as well as social services and really covets a, a very vulnerable population. However, his interest in this is almost purely monetary as it should be uh, to a certain extent. And we used to have dialogue about some of his concerns with some of his residents, his tenants. And uh, when I realized uh, who he was mostly housing, uh, we actually made a bet that I could come in and devise something that would make it monetary for him, but also uh, help bring these people whole. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I had to come up, I had to canvas the community. I actually live within the community in one of his um, um, buildings. And uh, I'll give you an example of the individuals that I'm working with and I'm doing some case management now. Uh, a gentleman who did 32 years in the system straight, went in at 17 and came out at 50. And um, has no skills, no, no, no practical learning skills. And uh, through my canvassing of him in this dialogue and moving throughout our relationship, I have come to find out that he has never really paid rent, but now our social service system gives him money to pay rent, but not enough for pocket money. So we're dealing with these issues. Another uh, individual that I'm currently doing case management with is, um, has done 14 years in the system um, and is an ex-offender as well as an ex-sex offender. So that limits his ability. So, you know, and having my conversations with them and finding out what are some of these issues that he's engaged with in these roadblocks. Uh, one of the important things I have found in regards to canvassing this community is not only looking at the demographic that would be served and having a series of conversations with a lot of these individuals, but also with the service agencies that provide service for them. Uh, in canvassing and meeting some particular needs, uh, an individual had a dental issue. Well, since COVID, uh, a lot of the dentists have been come back into the area uh, or, or, or are practicing. And so there is one community center that was the mainstay for health in the particular community and uh, they only have one dentist, one dentist. You can only get an appointment once a month. And so he was in a crisis, what do you do? But I learned this through canvassing and meeting his particular needs. Um, I look at canvassing and I'm just gonna come back to this because I don't wanna run short of time. I look at canvassing as also a very strong networking mechanism. Uh, with this current project and deserving the sake of building this particular um, project, 
there's several points to the canvassing that I was able to do through not only speaking with the residents, but community service agencies, and then also my colleagues and my professionals that were doing that as this advisory board to bring this about, is that the canvassing has assisted us in obtaining information more specific to the population. Um, helped me to develop an advisory board because I started calling around and asking my, my, my colleagues and, and individuals in the industry about certain things. I was able to find out additional information. Uh, I was able also in my canvassing in order to meet needs through my community, through my case management of several of these tenants is find out about the service-based agencies, how they deliver services, what that criteria is. And then also the physical environment. There is no store within two walking miles that has fresh fruits and vegetables where I am. Um, there is no store that has like a healthy smoothie drink or, or better meals, purposes and things of this nature. Uh, there are no activities, there are no bars, there are no social cafes, anything of that nature. Uh, so when we look at that and, and, and what is you know important for a community in order to build through that canvassing this is some of the data that we came up with what's more important for me at this point in time is that this canvassing has opened up a dialogue uh, uh, and has expanded thoughts on this subject that most individuals did not pay mind to uh, for instance my canvassing has found me to know that there are specific words now in new york state they have abolished the word inmate it's a law. And you know, that would be something, oops, sorry, that was my timer. I have one minute to summarize. Uh, also, uh, canvassing also lays the groundwork for continued relationships uh, to shape and build and modify and refine your programs. Uh, we have to go back out there again. COVID has changed some of the mindsets, some of the needs of some of our particular people. So that's where that effective exchange comes in from knowing a little bit more about where people are now at this point in time. And uh, it is vital to affect a, uh, exchange. You have to be able to understand what is on people's minds in order to get them back into the swing of things. And in order for you to be able to develop or provide any particular needs that they are looking for. Uh, I hope that I have been, uh, Cynthia even has to canvas communities when she has an applicant, when she has to look at how to best place this individual or where is that community and how it's forming and what it's going to deliver and to have the best sense of what's going on. And it's something that we each and all do every day. Um, on my last 30 seconds, so I wanna say that it is something that you do. It's how you're doing it and how you're applying it makes it more worthy to you and you see better feedback from that sweat you put in from knocking doors and making it much more intimate, which is one of the other things I really love about Echo Universities. Much love and blessings, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Proper. That was wonderful. I loved your focus on canvassing and listening and conversations because that is the start of all important, meaningful, lasting, sustainable work. Because if we don't have conversations and listen to one another, we're not, you're not gonna make any progress whatsoever. So I really love that. I love that focus. Thank you so, so much. Um, next, we are going to hear from Daikin Patel. Do we have Daikin? If Hello, namaste. Yeah. I always share that not namaste, like the crazy within me, honoring crazy within you. So celebrating each one of your presence here. And uh, my name is Deacon. And right now I am based in part of the planet called Slovakia in Europe. I origin from India and I started my journey as a stock trader, investment banker, then pilgrim, then clown. Right now I'm speaking as a co-founder of Swarraj Yale University, 
and tomorrow I don't know who I will be. So um, just in a constant battle of who will prevail, my mind or my heart. So uh, just the invitation, I like to give you one invitation. Before we start about Swaraj Jail University, it's a great opportunity for all of us to reflect like what kind of jail or what kind of prison we are into right now. So it's a jail is not really a physical thing, but uh, Swaraj Jail University, it has been started on 2018 with the collective effort of few friends and organization. Just intention to just self design learning and and just uh, help inmates to explore their passion, gain the practical skill, reignite that self-esteem and leadership and life vision, especially in this time of numerous challenge inside the prison. So I think uh, I would request Aline for maybe she can play the video so you can just get the idea how the project look like on a ground. So I just request you, Alan. Okay, can you guys hear and see this? Actually, jail is a tension for the outside and the inside, because the biggest problem is to define the case, and then the loss of the family. So, the people who are in stress, and the other problems are the same. The basic thing here is that the people who are in jail are in the same way, and the people who are in jail are in the same way. When they want to keep their words, it's right or wrong, it's a different thing. पर वो कहना चाहता है कि मैंने अपराध क्यों किया या ये घटना क्यों हुई या इसमें मेरा कितना दोष है उसको सुनने वाला कोई नहीं है। जेल में मुख्यतः एक बंद व्यवस्था की तरह इसका प्रयोग किया जा रहा है। अब धीरे-धीरे इसमें सुधार आ रहे हैं। वस्तुतः जेल में ओपन होनी चाहिए, खुली होनी चाहिए। जितने बाहर के लोग जेल में आएंगे, उतना ही सुधारात्मक प्रक्रिया को गति मिलेगी। जितना हम इसको क्लोज रखेंगे, जितना हम इसको बचा� साल से मैं देख रहा हूँ कि यहाँ काफी एक अच्छी प्रवृत्तियाँ चल रही हैं, जैसे संगीत का चल रहा है, तो संगीत क्लास में तो हम 
सात आठ महीने से जाते हैं और वहाँ लोग अच्छी अच्छी चीज़ें सीख रहे हैं दूसरी चीज़ है सुबह में योगा चल रहे हैं तो योगा से सबका स्वास्थ्य पे और मन पे एक अच्छी असर आ रही है बाकी यहाँ कंप्यूटर चल रहा है और पेंटिंग चल रहा है और जैविक खेती का तो उसकी वजह से क्या है कि एक हमको गुरुकुल जैसा लग रहा है जेल जैसा नहीं लग रहा है कि यहाँ कुछ ना कुछ सीखने को मिल देखते हैं कि इंजीनियर है डॉक्टर है अपराधी है तो उस मोमेंट में सारे लेबल ड्रॉप हो जाते हैं वेन यू सी एज अ वन एवरी थिंग वेन यू एबल टू शेड ह्यूमैनिटी एंड दैट्स रियली क्रिएटिंग लॉट्स ऑफ पॉसिबिलिटीज और सबसे सुंदर जो गुरुजी ऐसा बोलते हैं कि कोई भी अपराधी जन्म से अपराधी नहीं होता उसके हालात उसकी मजबूरियाँ या कुछ ऐसा समय जो उसे वो करा देता है वो कोई जन्म से नहीं होता तो उसमें ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन भी हो सकता है और हमने ऐसे देखे भी ये हवा ये फिजा ये नजारे ये समा Thank you thank you for sharing this video and um as i share like uh, the prison is not physical thing and when you go more deeper about prison it's um, it's represented you or represents for our collective consciousness it's it's showing as a society as a race our current and past actions so it's a great mirror for all of us to see within ourselves and window as a see to in each other and as education because i was into i born in islam and then my journey goes on i'm not going into deep into that but i heard lots of like what is education i was just in that quest and i found simple thing simple answer like where basically when passion meets with the purpose so just for rajil university helping and catalyzing to between passion and and purpose so it's just there is a no teacher there is a no learner like everybody's teacher and everybody's learner in in swaraj jail university and and in adverse circumstances there is always opportunity to love and to serve so and and in that space you find all the answers what you are seeking for or what you are looking for so swaraj jail university is just being catalyzing between society and inmates and and they're they're helping them to reignite the spirit of humanity so i think i just stop here like i think my 10 minutes are over but but um hopefully like we can move from um like i was so much into meditation and lately i change meditation to med intentions so can we hold the the new possibilities of love can we find the new light of the day each day and may we all find light in all thing and love in everything thank you for 
your your presence with yourself with each other thank you thank you so much Deacon. um i think i can probably speak for everyone on the call to say that that was incredibly moving and um i was really moved by the music um, specifically in the video, which was just incredible, um, but also just the broader message and um, the work of um, transforming lives um, that uh, have been deemed, uh, you know, uh, incapable of redemption um, by society. Um, and we have this major problem in the US with our prison system, which people are chatting about. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Panina Lesorogal, I'm sorry if I did not get your name right. No, hi, you got my name right, thank you. Hi yes. everyone, so <laughs> yeah, I'm Penina Lesorogal and I am from Kenya. I'm a Maasai woman or, or Samburu. But, uh, I live in Europe, I live in Austria, right now I'm in Austria. And um, I'm so grateful to be here and I'm at the right place because it's the butterfly talks. And in Kenya, my tribe, the Samburu, are referred to butterfly people because of our colorful beadwork and clothing. The Maasai are known, I guess, worldwide with, uh, because of colorful um, dress code. So I'm so glad I'm here. I'm in my community. <laughs> and also, I'm a, I'm a a woman uh, who was born and raised in, uh, in a Maasai village and I'm um, among uh, the first girls to go to university in my village. And it wasn't easy, it was very rough. Maybe I can share uh, my screen and show you some photos. Don't know if Host disabled participant screen sharing. Can I share my screen, please? Yeah, okay, so I was born and raised in, in uh, a Maasai village, Samburu village, and I I wanted so badly to go to school and but people were like discouraging me on no you cannot go uh, to school because girls are not allowed to go to school they get pregnant they drop out of school you know all this and girls are born to be to to to, to give birth to children and just take care of the family but i i didn't listen to them and so this is me, I don't know if you see, um, this was me when I started school. I was very old, I was 13 years old. Do you see my screen? Uh, Penina, we don't see the main image, we just see the background. Oh, okay. Go open it and go forward, right? Okay. If you double click it, it might make it, um, should make it bigger. If you open up the picture and then. Yeah, like. No, I think it cannot. We have seen all the pictures. You I see? think you're only sharing the window that has all the pictures. If you can't uh, like leave, uh, turn off your sharing the screen and then pick the window that has the photo that you're looking for, or you can do your oh. whole screen. Okay, okay, like this. Or in the, Click on in the this. Zoom, I think share computer instead of program it might allow if you switch I over share, computer. share screen like share screen it, it will bring everything so um, maybe with, stop sharing your screen if you want to uh, and your screen share and, then, and then try again yeah okay, okay. yeah so you, when you click share screen i think yeah. there's a couple of options maybe share screen then if you switch programs it will bring up the photo bigger i think mm. Mm, okay, I, I don't. Should we share your website? Because then everybody has access. Yes, please. Maybe this is. Mm -hmm. so, oh, oh, I we'll try just... clicking the green button, the green arrow share screen again, and it should yeah. pop up different options. Do you mm -hmm. see like, different interfaces? And just if there's one that says like share whole screen, 
or like desktop one? Desktop, yeah. Then we'll see what you see. Oh, good. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We might take a minute to figure it out. There we go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was born and raised here in this village, and. Yeah, I, I got so many discouragements because I'm a woman that I'm not supposed to be in uh, uh, to go to school. So I, I went to school anyway. So I don't know if you see this photo. I, I, I wanted to show you this photo. Do you see this photo? Yes. yes. So this is me. I started school when I was 13 years. I was very old and everyone was laughing at me. Yeah, I'm too old for school, but I started anyway. And this was my first school uniform. This is me and my brother and my sister in front of our mother's house. It's a Maasai uh, Manyata. So um, that's my journey, how I started to go to school. But then when I was in the university, um, it was on a like a Wednesday and my dad was calling me that I should come home by Friday because on Saturday is my wedding day. And I didn't know my husband. I don't know my husband, but it's traditional, it's culture. I respect my culture. It's the most beautiful uh, thing that happened to me, but there are also some things that are dark or not good. And since then, I wanted to change the position of women in my village. So I went to, I got married to this man, but it didn't work out because I was already educated and I know my ways and I had education as a weapon. And so I, I got out of there and I came to Austria. And then when I came to Austria, I started um, um, bid work uh, as an empowerment uh, weapon uh, to women in my village, those who never had an opportunity to go to school like me. So I started bid work and, and you can watch, maybe there's a video, um, uh, maybe later I, I will share my, uh, all the websites, things, and you can see the video, but I can just show you some photos of the women who I'm uh, working with. So I started uh, women empowerment uh, work in my village where we make bid work and then I come and uh, sell them in Europe. So I have like an online shop where this is me uh, in my village and my the women, most of the women are my family. We, we grow up in a village where the community, uh, uh, like Tina said, uh, there are these natural uh, or cultural villages uh, in Maasai, it's community, everything is community to us. So uh, these are my family and most of the women here are my family and the whole village is family because we are one clan. So we do bead work, we make beautiful bead work together. Uh, these are just photos. I'm just going through the photos that uh, show you what I do, these women. And also I wanted to include the men because uh, in Samburu, growing up as a Samburu or Maasai child, there are always games for boys, there are games for girls. You don't do this because it's only boys who do it. You don't do this because it's for girls. But I always grew up in this sense of doing the things that I'm not allowed to do. Like in my community, uh, a girl or a woman is, is a taboo for a woman to hunt. And I used to hunt when I was a teenager, I used to hunt gazelles because we, we live in the nature. We depend in the nature, we depend for our animals. So I used to hunt gazelles and we roast in the forest and eat. And when we come home, my mother is trying, we, we were four sisters. And my mother was trying to give us food and we said we are full and she's like, oh my God, they committed a sin because it's, a, it's, it's like a taboo for a woman to, to hunt. So I always did the things that uh, we were told not to do because you are a woman. So I, I wanted to, to, you know, like to separate that. I didn't want to grow or my children to grow up in such a, um, a community. Okay, I love my community, it's beautiful, but there are things that I want to change. So I started this um, bid work and I wanted to include men also. These are young, very young uh, warriors. They are called Morans. And they also make bid work and they pay school fees through bid work and also young girls. So that's what we do in my community. And these are the uh, finished products. 
When I finish them, I bring them to Europe and sell them. These are bracelets. These all are bracelets, necklaces. They're so beautiful. That's why we are called the butterfly people. And recently I started a very beautiful uh, project. Like a month ago, I was in Kenya, uh, the project of agroforestry. So I come from a semi-desert place where it's water is so scarce. And right now people are moving from one place to another, looking for water, for pastures, for their animals, because we are nomads, we, 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 the planet is our home. So we move from one place to another. When it rains like somewhere, we move there. And so that's what, what it is in, in our village. So recently I thought maybe we lack rain because of uh, our environment, maybe we could, change that by growing some trees around. So I started this uh, project of growing trees. There's a, a video that I prepared, but I, I don't think I have time for that. So, and yeah, we still do, we do all together with women and men. Basically, when I started this, I wanted to change the position of women in my village. But then I remembered that there are things that we are limited. There are things that, that the society doesn't want us to do together. I want to live in a community where we work together. There is nothing like this is for men, this is for women. I, I really wanted to bring out this to my community and it's amazing because it's working. So we are working together as a community to grow together. And yeah, I had a video, but I maybe I will just share in, the, in our chat because of the time so people can watch uh, at their free time. So yeah, that's what I do. And now in uh, I live in Austria, I also do some projects. Daniela is here, we do some projects with Daniela and I feel like I belong in a community. So yeah, I'm so glad to be part of this world community of the whole world, not just of my culture or or in Graz, but also the whole world, um, looking at these beautiful people and sharing ideas, sharing the, the stories of our lives. It's really amazing. And the love is overwhelming. And it's really giving me um, like um, an inspiration that the world needs more people, you know, to come together, to create a community. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, now we have computers, we have everything we can meet uh, uh, and talk. And I feel like I know some people here and I've never seen you. I don't even know where most of them are, but it's amazing. I, I feel the love. So thank you so much. And that's my story. Panina, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm struck by the the strength of character your strength of character and um standing up for first yourself for your uh, ability to get an education and uh kind of swimming against the current um but then also bringing back um uh to your community what, you, what you're giving back to the community and building building community amazing unbelievable thank you thank you Roy. Thank so you. much um, I have to admit, I was thinking of myself as a moderator and, and not as a co-presenter, and uh, I'm deeply humbled, as I said from, <laughs> as I said at the start, I'm humbled by my my other panelists, um, and I didn't really come very prepared. Um, I uh, I'm sort of uh, impromptu going to share a video um, that is from uh, a school that I ran in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, this is several years ago before my daughter was born. Um, it was called the Alternative Diploma Program. And we worked with 32 students um, in a kind of post-industrial um, mill town, um, which is quite famous actually in American history, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. And um, uh, these were students facing significant barriers to their education. Um, and we worked to re-engage them uh, with yeah, relationship building was core to everything we did. Um, community building, restorative justice, peace circles, youth voice and decision making, um, and uh, 
just uh, social justice themed curriculum, project based learning, like all the things that I'm passionate about in education, I tried to channel into this into this program. This this is a um, a video that a filmmaker made, um, and he was embedded with the organization for um, for two years almost, and so he really got to know the students and. Um, he made a really a very, a very nice film, um, which I will share. Can you guys see the um, screen? Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Except we don't have sound. Yeah, no audio, and you might want to full screen it too if you want. So to get sound, you actually maybe stop sharing. And then when you click share at the bottom, there's like a little box um, along the bottom to include sound. To include? So you have you stop your share? Yeah. Oh, sorry. And then when you reshare. Yeah. Um, when share sound. Share yeah. sound. Exactly. Optimize for video recording. OK. Sorry about that. What is the most romantic love story ever written? Romeo's a serial killer, right? <laughs> Everyone's dying. It's gang violence. The Alternative Diploma Program is a partnership between UTech and the Lowell Public Schools that enables 32 students who have either dropped out of high school or are at high risk of dropping out of high school to earn their high school diploma. The environment is just so different than Lowell High. You know, Lowell High School is a, it's a good school, um, but it's, it's huge. It has almost 4,000 students. Generally speaking, we have no more than 12 people probably in each class, and often quite a bit smaller than that. They often say they felt lost at the high school. It kind of felt like the high school didn't care for what else was going on in your life. They feel what they're studying in school is disconnected from their lives. We try to bridge that and say, you know, no, learning should be relevant to what you care about. We utilize project-based learning, a health class where students are looking at issues of food justice and working on a community garden or a science class, testing the water quality of the Merrimack River. Being able to go out and really experience the science. We want to actually change their perception of learning and what learning can be. That kind of creative side, uh, the less analytical side, is more comfortable for some of these students. I do a, like an art project that includes the math that they're learning. They push you just hard enough that you do it and get it done. You still have fun while you're doing it. That's the push I needed. We've had students that have dealt with housing insecurity. Two students that gave birth to their children while in the program. In that situation, you know, going to algebra class is not the priority. It's putting food on the table. Sometimes in traditional schools, you need to just get through the content and the relationships would come second. Every young person is assigned to a transitional coach, a TC. It can range from going to court, find housing, find a job, anything that they need help with. All you have to do is talk about it with someone. You still get work done, but they also help you with whatever is preventing you from doing it at that time. The young people in ADP, to me, are like incredibly inspiring. My mom passed away when I was 15, and my dad passed away two years ago. It's, it's been tough. The high school was saying, we're just so frustrated with her because she just she doesn't come to school. She just hangs around downtown all the time. The classes were overwhelming and it wasn't interesting. I skipped all, all the time. And then I come here and it's a very happy like atmosphere. It's a comfy place where I can express myself and I still get work done. She became very much a part of UTech and part of ADP, great leadership, always positive. I just don't know if she wants to finish high school at this point. I'm never leaving this place, <laughs> like ever. There's a huge focus on community. We're just a big open family. There's not a lot of places where you can go these days where you can find that community council meetings once a week. We have talking circles uh, where students have an opportunity to share their story. No one is less or more than another person. Everyone has something different to bring to the table. We have students that wouldn't know each other in a large school and they're in class together. They might be sitting together at lunch. And they know each other's stories. Yeah. <laughs> 
Shaq is an amazing young person, a great sense of humor. He's someone who has had a long history of behavioral issues. They keep me a little hyped if I'm not even aware. I think he's had a lot of experiences which made him dislike teachers, dislike school, dislike authority. When he's given a genuine leadership role, then he shines. You really don't expect this from a school. And the teacher, they treat you like you're an adult. They don't treat you like little kids, yeah. I feel like he's trying to balance between him being this funny, goofy kid, trying to separate that and buckle down and do what he needs to do. Fooling around, being the class clown, that's what I am. He's very smart and he's very insightful. I don't think he trusts that everybody feels that way about him. And as a result, he puts up these boundaries. Someone who's tough, not to be you know, messed with. And that's the mask that he's put forward. I feel like deep down, he actually really loves this place. At UTech, we talk about not falling for the mask. That's really all it is. It's just the outward appearance has nothing to do with who they are as a person. UTech as a whole, they don't strip that away, but they encourage and support going beyond that. This is a group of society that's been labeled in so many ways, you know, at risk, high risk, or the bad kids. All these expectations that they have of themselves based on failures, quote unquote, that they've had in the past. I know you've had these other experiences and made you feel that way, but I don't, I don't believe it. I'm not buying it. I still believe you could be successful. It's really ironic that somebody would think of them as not as capable because they really knock it out of the park. We have some of the brightest, hardest working young people in Lowell, and we see them as really full of energy, full of intelligence, full of wisdom and experience. For the first time in my life, I felt like I was the one in control of my education. Everyone is equal. Everyone's opinion matters. No one is too different or too dumb or too ambiguous. No one is left behind. I now know I have what it takes to be a strong student and an even stronger member of my community. Almost everything that I once viewed as being impossible, I now know is possible. So thanks for uh, listening to the video. I'm getting a little choked up watching that myself. That was a number of years ago. Um, that was uh, that was a big part of my life uh, for three years, and um, I'm a little choked up there. Um, so I'm just seeing folks that I, young people and colleagues that I worked with um, so closely uh, for so long. Um, you know. Uh, that job ended. Um, I resigned from my position when my daughter was born. Um, she was born very prematurely, over three months early. In fact, she's 26 weaker, uh, one pound, just over a pound. And um, she spent five months in the NICU and uh, came home requiring um, oxygen support and uh, feeding tube and 24 seven pulse oximetry. We were running a NICU out of our house. So um, I could not care for my daughter um, and run a high school in Lowell. So I stepped down from that position and um, you guys met Shaq in that, um, in that video and um, probably the most touching moment of my entire career was on my last day at UTech. The kid, the young people all knew what I was going through because my daughter had been born three months before I kind of transitioned out of the role and um, they threw a party for me. They threw a going away party for me and uh, the students and um, it was an it was an amazing celebration. And, and at one point during the day, someone said, hey, Shaq was looking for you. Shaq had graduated. And he, he said, uh, they said, Shaq is looking for you. Um, he had to work today, but he wanted to say hello. And I said, okay, I made a note of it. And later in the day, like almost, I was almost about to leave my last day, like four o'clock, someone called me and said, Shaq is here to, to say hello. And I went downstairs to the lobby of the building. And um, Shaq, who's like, very tough kid who we worked with for two years and you know uh ran me ragged <laughs> and we had all these experiences with it he said roy thank you for everything you did for me and that was it and that was probably my proudest moment as a teacher <laughs> um <laughs> just uh you know but but anyway um you know right now uh I, uh, I'm no longer in education. I am, uh, probably should have spent a little, had my time a little better. I only have another minute or so, but, um, 
I'm doing something completely different, which is um, mostly I'm a dad, but I'm also running a, um, a bookstore, a community owned bookstore um, called Rosie Bound, which is um, in the process of incorporating as a uh, cooperative that will be uh, worker owned and consumer owned. We have five worker owners and we're about, once we incorporate, we'll start recruiting consumer owners for a hundred bucks, you'll, you'll become, you'll own a share in the, in the business. And uh, we want to do more than sell books. You know, I'm a teacher at heart. And, uh, you know, we see the bookstore as being also a community learning space, community gathering space, workshops, classes. Um, I'd love to do work with youth again. Um, once we're, you know, once we have our feet a little bit underneath us. Uh, right now, we're just trying to pull it all together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Um, we'll now um, open it up for questions. Um, if you can raise your hand digitally or in your screen. We have a question for any of the panelists. Uh, Rebecca. I'm Marie actually, but I was- Oh, wondering... sorry. No, you're fine. It, it says Rebecca. <laughs> Um, what is the like status of the school now, the program for you? The alternative diploma program does not exist anymore, sadly. And it's a long, complicated political story that uh, has partly to do with the fact that I wasn't around to fight for the program um, when we needed to fight for it because my daughter was in the NICU fighting for her life. So I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do both. And um, we, we were subject to political winds shifting in Lowell, um, unfortunately. And it's a longer story and, and I should probably write it up one day as an article, but um, unfortunately the program does not exist anymore, uh, which saddens me. It's probably, probably why I got a little sad at the, at the end there. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, we have yeah. a question. <laughs> yeah. Go for uh, it. Um, so uh, the the like problem of scaling up has been on my mind a lot recently, and I'm curious for for everyone who presented today, like, is bringing the the types of changes to education and community that you've been focusing on are you interested or do you feel like it's a, a necessary or valuable thing to bring these to a larger scale of having not just one or two programs but thousands of them or like many thousands of people benefiting from it or is the goal more so on a local level um yeah I, I'll, I'll leave it there i guess I would like to say the particular program that I'm trying to develop and, and uh, I didn't have enough time to be as specific as I needed is that uh, part of the situation with the individuals that I work with is that, you know, if you complete all of your time on the books, when you come home, there is no segue, there's no fair bridge. So we're talking about an individual who left the streets at the age of 17, a teen, and now you're coming back at the age of 50, a full grown man, and you've missed all of that skill building. So this program that I'm looking to develop that teaches life skills and helps with a better segue is actually something that could unfortunately here in the United States be replicated in any community because it is something that is affecting a specific demographic. And it has that same impact throughout each of the same communities throughout America for African Americans, for Black Americans coming out of, or Black and Brown Americans coming out of the penal system. So it is really bringing about that awareness because we're asking people to perform things as something they don't even know. And that is something that's really affecting all of the communities throughout America in that regard, once they re-enter in from the penal system. Yeah, I could share, um, when I think about scaling up, 
I really like this different fit phrase of scaling laterally. So instead of like bigger and more people and that's better, taking models and universal principles and then applying them to different locations. Because I think with intentional communities, like people often ask, what's the best practice? Or like, we want to create the perfect model and then just spread it everywhere. And it's like, well, each group is so different. Each place is so different and, and that diversity is beautiful. So I think if there's a way that we can share ideas or practices like we're doing now and, and already we're seeing at FIC um, huge interest, um, especially since COVID in intentional communities and more um, like a, a cultural shift, not as much stigma around the concept, more people interested. Um, so I think that's the kind of scaling that I'm, I'm interested in. Yeah, totally. I will say that um, one of the reasons why I've moved into the cooperative enterprise space, which is a for-profit space, by the way, um, we are a for-profit, um, after spending, um, you know, over 10, well over 10 years in the nonprofit educational sector, was some frustration with the, you know, philanthropic industrial complex, you know, which is, um, I find very frustrating and, you um, you know, wealthy people deciding how, um, you know, working folks should and poor folks should spend their money. Um, you know, it's called a donor advised fund, right? Have you ever heard this phrase, a donor advised fund? I think we should flip it up, upside down. I've actually thought about starting something called the Upside Down Foundation, which would be a donee advised fund. So basically, rich people should listen to poor people and working class people on how they should spend, you know, the money that they've earned through capitalism. But um, anyway, I could, you know, that's my soapbox for a moment. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I see more um, potential in um, cooperatives in because I want to be independent. I don't want to actually um, ask for grants. Um, I'm trying to do this without grants. I'm trying to, I would love to get back to where I was before with working with young people, um, but in a more um, uh, less dependent way, you know, in that we're kind of, um, we're keeping the lights on and running, running things because um, we're owned by the community and we're run by the community democratically. Um, and we don't need grants because we're going to, we're going to have our own um, sources of, of revenue. So anyway, that's my latest thinking on, on that. I, I'm, I believe it will be more sustainable, but of course, talk, talk to me in a couple of years. <laughs> I'll, get back to, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Any other panelists want to weigh in on that question of sustainability, uh, Deacon and Pen Penina? Yeah. Um, I'm okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No. So for me, uh, scaling up, uh, uh, according to me on what I'm doing right now, is uh, like to spread the word to my community, to every, that it reaches every part of my community, that there are things that culturally are not okay. And, and to scale up in this idea, like, like let's say uh, to grow trees, I, when we start in one village, we, we go through the others and the whole uh, Samburu district will be, you know, like we scale up together. Like we go, we grow more trees by uh, telling other communities or, or neighbors or also with the women, how they treat women. Like, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, my, my culture is the most beautiful culture in the world. There's only this one percent that I don't like. <laughs> and to scale up for me in this, in this uh, uh, to put myself in this idea of scaling up is to teach my community, to show them that um, educating a girl is like educating the whole community because we will always come back and, and, and empower uh, other people in our community. So the more I talk about this to women, to men, to girls, the more we grow together as a community and, and uh, sooner or later, as my grandmother said once, that because I always ask my grandmother, who said that girls should not go to school? My grandmother would only say one word. The first man said. I didn't know who the first man said. But before she died, she died when she was 105 years old. And she told me one thing. You know, you remember the question you always ask me, and I always give you one answer. You ask different questions, but I give you one answer. So I tell you today, you have to do what you believe that you can do. And 
in probably in 100 or 200 years to come, they will say the first woman said, and that first woman should be you. So I have this in my, I'm, I'm a girl on fire trying to go to this 200 years to come, the first woman said. So this is scaling up for me. Thank you, Panina. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. I know Deacon, you, um, could you try to, I know you want to answer the question um, as well on sustainability scaling up, yeah. Okay, just just quick, quick, quick reflections uh, about that question is, uh, um, it's, it's always, you know, like what I feel personally, like one is scaling up and one is going more deeper. Like all the complexities are really, like exist on the level of consciousness. The more you go deeper, you know, you set the example, the more experiments, more, you know, prototyping, it can creating a larger possibilities. Like, and once it become like example, so many people are started following like slowly or possible, no. So, so that, that's my, my, um, my thoughts, my, my view. Like uh, somebody is doing so passionately and it being transmitted. So definitely we can scale up, but we need more spirit, you know, like uh, we need more Roy, maybe we need more Penny, we need more people who is doing with putting their all consciousness and that can be possible. Um, like these possibilities we can hold together collectively. So that's my...